Hi guys. Um, I wanted to come on here and share kind of what's been going on for the past, um, well, months really. It's been a little while since I've posted a video update. Um, and I guess it's going to be kind of another good news, bad news situation. Um, I haven't done an update in a while because my health status hadn't really changed. Um, I think last time I left off with having periodic bleeding ever since the summer, um, where I'd go maybe two weeks and there was, <clears throat> excuse me, I wouldn't have any bleeding. And then every two weeks I'd have like a little bit of streaks when I coughed or maybe just a little bit more. Um, and then I would stop. They would want me to stop some of my treat, well, most of my treatments. They'd want me to stop exercise. And then um, the bleeding would kind of stop after a day or two. And then I could add some things back on. And then I could get back to kind of my normal routines. And then a week or two would go by and I'd do it again. And so that didn't really change that piece of it. I've still had bleeding. I don't think I've gone more than 15 days since this summer without having some kind of bleeding, um, which is really frustrating. I'll kind of get into more of that in a minute, but um, sorry, I've said um like 5,000 times. Two weeks ago, I got sick uh, right, right after Thanksgiving, like three or four days, I think, after Thanksgiving. And it just started out with like congestion and sore throat and nothing. It kind of felt like a mild cold. It wasn't that big a deal. And I think after, and I'll tell you what this is if you're wondering, but it'll be a little bit. So I'll share in a minute. Um, after about three or four days of having like a cold, I started having a more productive cough, which can go along with the cold for me. That kind of is how it goes. It kind of ends up going to my lungs a little bit. So that wasn't a shock. And then that evening I had some streaks of blood again, and it had been maybe a week or so since I had done it previously. So it wasn't like a huge shock again, but frustrating. And then on a couple days after that, which is a, was a Friday night, I started coughing up like straight blood and it was just a little bit like a teaspoon or two. I mean, it wasn't, <clears throat> it wasn't like I was in danger of, you know, um, losing too much blood or anything like that. But it really was hard because it, it had been the most blood I had had all summer or since the summer, you know, all since last five months. And so I realized that I had some tranexamic acid on hand, which I talked about this, I think, in my podcast. It was a medication that they put me on years ago, back before I started Trikafta, that new medicine. Um, I had had a couple years where I did this exact same thing, where I'd have bleeding every week or two or every couple days or maybe, you know, bigger stretches, but it just kept coming back. It never, it never went away. So they put me on this medicine, tranexamic acid, which is a clotting medicine. And they often give it to women that, um, have like really heavy periods. It just helps lessen the bleeding and it's the same for the lungs. The crappy part about that is that it's a clotting medicine. So like I'm at higher risk right now for clots, you know, in your legs or heart attack, stroke, you know, clots in your lungs. Um, so that's kind of the trade-off. But for now I'm on, I, I, I decided that Friday night to start that medication without even asking anyone because it was, a, I didn't want to have to call my doctors on the weekend and I knew they'd be fine with it. So I started that and it was kind of like I just reached a wall. I'm going to try not to cry on this thing. Um, we'll see how that goes. I reached a wall on Saturday that next day. And it was kind of like, it was kind of like the last five months leading up to that day. I had been able to kind of like keep paddling water, just keep paddling water. Like I can only exercise for maybe like every week out of two or maybe week and a half out of two. And that was kind of enough. Like I felt like I'm still doing productive things. I'm still doing the things I like to do to, to control the things I can control for my health. 
by doing all my treatments and doing my exercise when I'm not bleeding. And it was kind of like, that's working. Like, it's not ideal. And I'm still kind of building up this emotion of like fear and worry and not quite to hopelessness, but it was kind of building. And when the bleeding just kept come, you know, just didn't ever stop. But it was like, once I hit, like now I'm coughing up straight blood. And at my last CF clinic appointment, which had been like a month or two before that, it was, you know, I was told that basically what they think is happening is I had had a really bad infection like five or six years ago, I think, or four or five years ago. It was an abscess, like a huge area of infection in my lungs. And when that happened, blood vessels kind of like grew in that area and grew bigger, more dilated kind of, like bigger vessels in that area than are normally there. And so they don't just go away. So the infection is basically gone. I have a little bit of scarring there, but I have the infection is basically gone for the most part in that area, which is awesome. But those blood vessels are still really big there. And so they think that I'm just kind of nicking that area over and over with cough or, you know, anything, just pressure in there, um, in those blood vessels that, that make them bleed. And so it just felt like, it just felt like there was no options to, to have anything change. It was kind of like, well, I guess this is my life now again. Like I'm going to have to just wait around and be super inactive when I'm bleeding, not feel like I can go out and do much of anything and be as like sedentary as possible to get the bleeding to stop, which is kind of a joke because I take care of Jackson all day at home. So like I'm picking him up 50 times, like I'm still kind of active, but when I can be, I'm sitting, trying not to, you know, do a lot. And it's just, it's just really hard mentally to kind of be in that spot where you're like, I feel like I can't live my life. Like, I am just waiting this out. For what though? Because it's just going to happen again and again and again and again. And like I said, I was kind of able to like, cope kind of throughout those five months when it was just streaks and it would last a day or two but the rest of those week or two I could still do what I needed to do and it felt like I was like paddling water like I just have to keep going like I can kind of maintain this I'm kind of doing okay and then when I started coughing up the straight blood it was like this could just get worse and worse and worse to the point where like what if I can never exercise what if I have to just sit around and do nothing like for the rest of my life and that's not super logical, but it's not totally outside the realm of possibility. And so I found myself like sobbing to Chad that Saturday. So like the day after coughing up a bunch of blood. Um, or maybe it was even that night. But I, t- I talked to Chad for like two hours and I just, it was like, I finally just hit a wall. I was like, I, all of this emotion just built up and I couldn't do anything. And so it just all hit me. And it's such a tough situation because I feel like it's hard when I want to share like all of my fears and worries and stuff. And I kind of try not to do that very often, especially to the people I love because it scares them. Um, It, you know, puts them in like it can make him spiral. It can make, you know, he starts thinking worst case scenarios about all these things that he hadn't even considered yet. And so I'd like, I hate doing that to him, but it was, I felt like I didn't know what else to do, honestly, in, in that moment. And so that's what I did. And then, and I just couldn't stop crying. I'd go five minutes without crying. And then I would think I'd be like, okay, I'm back, you know, I'm, I'm done with that. And no, it just kept coming. And then like the next day or maybe two days later, I talked to my mom and my sister about all of it because I they had known about the bleeding kind of all along. Um, but they didn't know that I had gotten sick again and that I had, you know, coughing up blood. And now I'm just mentally in this like awful place. And I think I cried with them on the phone for like three hours. Um, just doing the exact same thing. Like this is all my fears. This is what I am concerned about and like why I feel like there's no no way to fix it. Um, 
And so that basically led to me um, writing a letter, an email to my CF team saying, I mean, kind of what had actually been going on as far as the blood and starting the tranexamic acid and kind of, is that okay? Because I, I did it anyway. <laughs> um, and then just letting them know, like, I'm actually not okay mentally. Like, I'm crying while I'm writing this. I've been crying the last two or three days and just can't stop. And that's just kind of not like me, at least not in recent years. Um, and and I kind of expected them to maybe, like, address a few things and then really, like, at my next CF clinic appointment in like a month or two to kind of like talk through most of this. So I really wasn't expecting the response I got, which was, we need to see you today. We want to see you today. We want to see what we can do to figure out this bleeding. Um, we want you to meet with the, and in my, in my email, I said, it's probably a good idea for me to meet with the psychologist that they have on staff because I'm just, I'm having a really hard time like reframing my thoughts in a positive way. I normally am really good at that. When I'm struggling, I can like find the good, find the things I'm grateful for, find the, some sort of silver lining or some sort of hope. And in this, I just couldn't get there. And so I, so they, when they wrote me back, they're like, okay, we want to see you today. We want to see kind of what we can do about this bleeding because this is not okay that you're kind of in this place. And we want you to meet with a psychologist. And so And in my email, I had also said, can I please, like, if I need to see anybody, can I see it through telehealth or like an online type situation? Because I was home with Jackson and Chad had like a very important meeting that day. He could not take off of work unless I was like, you know, going to the hospital dying. Like it would have been really hard for him to get off work. And so I was like, they're like, we really need to see you. And we we want you to come alone so that you can talk to you know, the, the psychologist and, and get some things done. Um, so I called my sister who, God bless her. Uh, I call her sobbing because I'm just so overwhelmed that I was not expecting to have to drop everything and go in to CF clinic. And she literally, I gave her like basically 20 or 30 minutes notice from when she, I called her to when she needed to be out the door coming to me, which is like a two hour drive. Um, and she just dropped everything threw some stuff in the car and like got in the car and came to, to watch Jackson for me and then pick up Ellie while I went to um, see my CF doctors. And when I got there, um, I first met with the psychologist, which was, which was helpful. I talked to him for probably 15 minutes or so. Um, and just kind of shared like what all I just shared with you guys, that this is kind of what's been going on. This is kind of where I'm at mentally. And I think I'm going to start seeing him regularly. I'm hoping he's kind of booked up, but hopefully I'll be seeing him or somebody else in his office periodically, which I think will be helpful. And he said something that I was like, you know, that makes so much sense. He's like, you know, I don't know you very well. We only talked just a little bit, but it kind of sounds like you're somebody who like has some thoughts, like worries and, and, you know, any, any thoughts, negative thoughts kind of. Um, and instead of kind of like, you know, your thoughts connect to your emotions, connect to your behavior, which reinforce your thoughts in that cycle. It's like, I tend to have those thoughts and then almost like skip over the emotion or just not sit in that emotion and then go directly to behavior. What can I do? What are the things I can do to like, feel like I have sense of a sense of control and like productivity and moving this in a good direction. And that normally works pretty well for me. I can normally have those thoughts be like, Oh, that makes me feel really uncomfortable, sad, worried, scared. So like move on to things you can do. But with this bleeding, it's like, I have those thoughts and then I have the, you know, a little bit of the emotion and then I move on to the do or the behavior but there's like so little that I can do right now. I, the things I lean on as like my mental health crutch is doing my treatments as consistently as possible and exercising as con- like consistently and in, in kind of in a healthy way for me as possible. And I cannot do those things when I'm bleeding. So I just have to sit there in my emotions and feel like I have no control over anything. I feel like I can do almost nothing. And that's when it was just like, 
it was working for me up to a point. And then once I had like the straight blood and I just had to sit there for like a week, it was all of the emotions just hit like at the same time. And that was when I was just like a puddle on the floor, like crying for three days, um, which made a lot of sense. I was like, yeah, I think that's absolutely part of the, you know, absolutely what happened and kind of how I cope the best or at least have in the past. Um, so I think, I think talking to him will be super helpful. And I think I'm, I'm actually like proud of myself that I, a couple of things, I reached out for help when I never would have done that years ago, ever. Um, and I, and I think that's part of why my CF team was like, you need to come in today because I never ever tell them that I'm like struggling. And, and, and for a few years now, I've done, been doing really well and I haven't really been struggling. But even in past years when I was struggling, I wasn't saying anything. Um, I wasn't saying to my CF team, hey, I've been crying all week, even if that was the case. Um, I was like, yeah, I'm fine. It's whatever. It's That was kind of my baseline at times. So it always kind of felt like there was no I don't know, not a big enough difference to mention it, I guess. Um, so I'm really glad that I reached out and they actually really took it seriously. That was awesome. I'm also really proud that like in the past, I talked about on my podcast how like I had an eating disorder off and on for a long time. And even though I was struggling to the level that I was this past like week or two, I feel like I'm so far removed from that type of those types of thoughts and like the types of behaviors that I would have done back then it wasn't even in my realm of thinking which is such a relief that it, I'm so glad that at least even though I I have kind of I felt like I had kind of exhausted my coping skills that I had had learned you know learned in the last decade or so I at least didn't find some really negative way to cope with that I feel like crying and reaching out for help is not the worst thing I could have done. So I feel like I handled it actually kind of as good as I could expect of myself. Um, so yeah, I guess it shows that like I've, I've come a long ways, but not without a lot of work. Um, so at that same appointment, I met with that psychologist, but then I saw my CF doctors and team and they were like, I don't know. I just, they, they took my email so seriously. Like you could tell they were like, I'm so sorry you're struggling this, you know, this much. We want to really work on this and figure out how to get you exercising again, how to get you consistently able to do your meds again. You need to be able to do that, which felt like, okay, like they're fighting for me to like fix this, try. Um, and so my doctor was kind of looking back through what we had done ever since I had the RSV and COVID this summer. And at that time, they they put me on an oral antibiotic, clindamycin, which I even knew at the time doesn't actually treat what I grow in my lungs. So I grow bacteria in my lungs all the time. Um, it's much kind of less now than it ever was like before Trikafta. But um, this clindamycin that they keep putting me on, it doesn't treat what I grow. And unfortunately, there's only a handful of antibiotics that do treat what I grow that are oral pills, um, but I am either allergic to them or I can't tolerate them. Um, like, for example, like Levaquin can, it causes me really bad joint pain. And they say I'm at like high risk for like an Achilles rupture if I keep taking Levaquin, so I can't take that, which leaves IV antibiotics, unfortunately. And so there are some IV antibiotics that do treat what I grow. And my doctor was like, you know, you had RSV and COVID back to back. That could have kind of kicked up some bacteria in there, like made it worse, basically, um, because your body's kind of fighting this virus and that bacteria can kind of proliferate, I guess. Um, and so he's like, you know, we haven't tried IV antibiotics. Are you open to that? And I was like, yeah, I mean, I don't. <laughs> This is the IV antibiotics. This is a pick line, and I can show you that a little bit in a little bit. Um, but I'm willing to kind of do whatever the heck I have to to hopefully clear some of this bleeding. Like it is possible that, like I said, those blood vessels are enlarged. But if 
but if there's infection sitting in there, then it could just be like irritating it over and over and over. And if we can clear some of, if there's some like kind of hidden infection in there um, that we can clear out, it will hopefully stop or at least like slow down the bleeding that happens, like make it farther apart when I experience that, which would be amazing. Um, and so he put in order for me to do IV antibiotics at home because I actually feel fine. Um, I, I have like a little bit of a cough, but I haven't had any bleeding now in like four or five days since they started the IV antibiotics, um, which is good. I'm scared to even say that because like it could happen anytime. Um, the, you know, more bleeding could happen anytime. Um, but I'm trying to just be happy that I'm not having bleeding right now. Um, yeah, so I got, I started the IV antibiotics about five days ago and I will show you on here how this works and how this is actually one of the antibiotics it comes in a little ball. It's called an elastomeric ball. Um, they're awesome. They're much preferred to the bag and a pole and that type of thing that you have to like lug around with you. These are awesome. Um, so it's kind of funny because like I've never, I don't know if I've ever been on IV antibiotics when I felt this well. And I guess that brings me to like the good news. So that was kind of some of the bad news. The good news is I feel well. <laughs> I feel good. Even though I just was kind of sick, like for a couple days I felt kind of crappy, but like I feel fine. Um, my lung function has stayed like the same. Like overall, it kind of does a little bit of this, but like it's still maintaining, which is awesome. Um, and it's, it's frustrating because like, if it were not for the bleeding, I would be right back where I was, you know, the last year or so, year, well, a couple years now of my life with Trikapta, like nothing else has changed. It's just this bleeding. So it's like, if we can just get the bleeding to stop, I'll be fine. Um, I was able to run like four or five days ago and I ran like a 5k and it was, and I did it kind of at a slower pace, but I felt good. Um, my lungs felt really good. I was kind of surprised after all of the bleeding and not being able to do meds and, and all and exercise that my lungs feel really good. So that's fantastic. I just want to be able to use them. And it just feels kind of like at this point, it's kind of like a quality of life issue. Like I want to be able to live like a productive life um so that's that's what we're trying to do is get the bleeding to stop i did talk to them kind of like a kind of like a worst case scenario thing if the bleeding continues and we've tried kind of everything we can possibly do um and it's still there there is a procedure that exists that i think i've mentioned before that they can go in and they go through like my artery and my groin and they fish it up basically up to my lungs to where those blood vessels are bigger and they can put something in there um, that clots that vessel. Hopefully it's not the right one, but it's kind of risky because there's a lot of things they could accidentally clot off if they're not a hundred percent certain that's the right spot. So it's not something they do until you have more severe bleeding, but they're, we kind of just talked about like, is it, feasible? Is it reasonable for me to even look into this procedure before I'm coughing up cups of blood or something? Um, because I just feel like I can't, I don't want to have to live like that where I'm like just sitting around waiting for bleeding to stop all the time. Um, so I guess, I guess we'll just see. I mean, it's kind of, it, it gives me some kind of hope that there's maybe at least an option on the table potentially if this doesn't work. Um, and there for a little while, I felt like it was literally hopeless and there was just nothing we could possibly do. And this is where I was at, um, which isn't necessarily the case. So I'm trying to, I try to talk myself back down. <laughs> like, we'll just, we're not there yet. Um, yeah. So in the midst of all of that, my my family was sick too. So like Ellie 
missed like a week of school because she got really sick. She had like high fever, really bad cough. She got croup like with it. So she was not breathing very well in the nights. And so that was kind of crazy. Um, I guess it's kind of funny because like I've had m many people ask how I've been doing the last you know couple months. And I think I always just say like, I'm good or I'm fine. Um, and I, th I think that's for multiple reasons, but I feel like I'm not as good about sharing what's really going on when in real life, I guess. I mean, I, I am with kind of my inner, inner group of people, but outside of that, it's so, it's harder for me to share that. Um, so I guess doing it this way feels easier to me for now, but I'm still kind of, I don't know, need more practice of like sharing it when people ask, but it's also, there are some people I know when they're asking, they really want to know the real truth. And there's other people that ask that I'm like, I don't know if they care. <laughs> I don't know that they need to hear my whole life story. <laughs> so I guess it's a balance. Um, yeah, I just, I think that's funny because I have been telling people like, I'm fine, I'm good. And like, in some ways I am, like, I feel good. I'm, I can breathe well. Like there are, in some ways I am fine, but in other ways it was like, I was starting to like reach panic mode, um, which I definitely did not share. On a kind of totally unrelated note, although maybe not entirely, I just watched this documentary this last like week or so called Stutz on Netflix. It's S-T-U-T-Z. And Jonah Hill, the actor, made a documentary about his therapist. And I highly recommend it. I think it's such a, um, it's just an interesting watch. And not only to kind of hear a little bit about their lives, both of them, Jonah Hill and his therapist, but his therapist gives some really, really good, useful like tools, I guess, for how to find happiness and how to cope, um, just coping skills, I guess, that are really like, I feel like user friendly and they give like a really good visual. Um, and I enjoyed it enough that I watched it with Chad again. Um, but he mentioned, and I've heard this before that, you know, gratefulness is like the key to happiness. And it's something I've really tried to work on in the last, I don't know, especially the last couple of years, I guess. Um, but Chad and I had this conversation today, this morning, that it's tricky because him and I are both very like goal oriented, like growth mindset, like constantly improve, constantly. Um, yeah, whether it be improve like facets of your life or improve your social relationships or improve yourself in, you know, physically and mentally. Um, and emotionally, but I feel like what's inherent in that mindset is that you're like scanning for like problems or things that are not like optimal and then you're going to fix them and you're going to do the things to fix them. And it can be hard to like be constantly scanning for the kind of the negative, I guess. And then also be like looking for the positives and looking for what you're grateful for and being in the moment. Like I am so focused on future planning. What's next? Be prepared for all the things at all the times. Um, so I, maybe that's something I need to talk to the therapist about how to like maintain the good aspects of that mindset of like constantly wanting to improve and constantly work, wanting to work on yourself and, and, you know, facets of your life, but also be able to be in the moment and focused on what's really going great. So I don't know. I need to work on that, I guess. But I just thought that was kind of interesting. Um, what else? The only other thing I was going to do was to show you about um, my pick line. So uh, here, I'll show you this first, and then I'll go grab some supplies. But this is just like a little cover thing for it to hold these tubes on here. So I don't. hopefully, if you're squeamish, maybe you don't want to see, but it's not that graphic. Um, so a pick climb, I've talked about it before, but an IV that you would normally have in the hospital, the catheter is only like that long, and maybe shorter, and goes in normally like your hand or somewhere on your arm, just a little bit, and then they can put fluids through there or medicines through there. 
the reason they normally don't send like me home on a with an IV, a normal IV, is because I mean a couple different things, but the antibiotics that go through my IVs are really um, uh, tough on my veins. Basically, they they will like cause inflammation and like pain after like a day. Um, they're really irritating, and so that's part of it. The other reason is a an IV can like easily kind of get um, pulled out, I guess. And also like, you can just have lots of different issues with it. You probably like, for me, I would need one every day or two because my veins get so irritated. I think if all goes well, you can keep an IV for maybe a week, but I need these, th this pick line for two weeks. Um, but what a pick line is, is the catheter goes in here and then it actually goes all the way up, like above my heart into the biggest, I think it's the superior vena cava. It's the one of your biggest veins. Um, and so that way it doesn't irritate that, that vein that goes in is so big. It doesn't, that medicine doesn't irritate the vein there. Um, and it's just, you can keep this for a long, long time. You can keep this for months if you need to. I, I should only need it for two weeks. Um, but it comes with, they have like two tubes in it. So like they can, I could do medicine in one side and something else. If they want to draw blood on the other side, they could do that. Um, so it always normally comes with two lumens is what they call them for me. And then I already showed you, but this is the antibiotic comes in this like little ball and it just basically squeezes it in once I get it hooked up. So I'm going to go grab something, um, some supplies and I'll be right back. Okay. I have my supplies. Um, and this is what I do. So I have to do this three times a day. So basically every eight hours, which is kind of crappy for sleep, but it lasts about an hour too. So it's not the most fun, but I'd much rather be doing this at home than in the hospital. So I will take that as a win. I'm just kind of getting all of these undone so I can show you. Okay, all I need is alcohol swabs. And then I pick which lumen I'm going to do. I need some saline to flush it with. And then, and I already washed my hands, so. And you want to always wash your hands because, um, a pick line goes, like I said, kind of right to your heart. So if there gets an, if there's an infection that gets in that line, it can be kind of more dangerous because it's going kind of directly to where your heart is. Um, so yeah, that's they always want to keep infection out of the pick line because of that. So I'm just using an alcohol swab to clean off the end of that, and then I get the bubble out of my saline and I hook this up. And then I can just push that in. And then I do alcohol again to clean it off. And then I just hook up. This isn't quite down to the end. There we go. I just need to hook up that line. And then I unclamp it. And then I can just take this with me. And I normally put it like in my pocket or like in my shirt. <laughs> um, and that way I can go do whatever I need to do. And it takes about an hour. And then when I'm all done, I just flush it again with saline. And then I put a little heparin in there, which is to make sure there's no clots that get in that pig line because it can get totally um, kind of clotted off and you won't be able to use it. So that's about it. Um, I We have a lot of fun things to look forward to for Christmas coming up soon. So um yeah, we, have, we do have a lot to be grateful for this year, and I, um, I doubt I'll be on here before Christmas or New Year's, so hope you have a great Christmas and a Happy New Year. Bye.